Okay. All right, we'll get Good. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to this morning's uh, press conference on the launch of the uh, Business Leadership Council for a generation born HIV free. Uh, my name is Kai Bucher. I'm from the media team here at the World Economic Forum. And uh, just before I hand over to uh, Mr. Megro here uh, to give an overview of uh, this initiative, uh, just a quick reminder uh, that uh, this press conference uh, is uh, streamed uh, live online right now. It is uh, on livestream.com slash World Economic Forum. And for those following, uh, they are also able to post questions online if they should have any questions for the panel today. Uh, but uh, just because also we're a little bit pressed for time, perhaps uh, without further ado, Mr. Um, John Megru, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, APAX, uh, could you uh, perhaps introduce our speakers here and give us an overview of this initiative? Sure. Thank you, Kai, and thank you uh, to WEF. You are wonderful hosts, as always. I'm John McGrew. I've been asked to uh, chair the Business Leadership Council for the Prevention of Mother-Child Transmission of HIV. And I'm here today with uh, Randy Zuckerberg, who, as you're probably familiar, is one of the real pioneers around uh, uh, social networking and media. Ambassador Eric Goosby, who runs PEPFAR, which is the United States uh, funding arm for HIV activities, including the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. And Dominic Barton, who is the CEO of McKinsey, the largest consulting firm in the world. And as an introduction, I'd just like to say the transmission of um, HIV from mother to child is something that can clearly be stopped. There are no technological issues around it. There's no medical issues around it. Um, it does not exist in the wealthy part of the world. But there are still almost 400,000 children a year born, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, with HIV. And this is a cause that we need to set, the business leaders, the, the wealthy countries, NGOs, we need to set a clear guideline. And the guideline that's been set for all of us is 2015. So we have four years, 48 months, to really crack the back of this. It's very achievable and the business community has uh, started to step in and that's why we're putting together this Business Leadership Council. With uh, these members and others, we have people from media, uh, technology, logistics, retail. We have fortunately uh, here Jamie Cooper Hahn who has uh, been around this for many, many years who runs the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Thank you, Jamie. So we're very excited, and we'll start with uh, Randy. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I feel so fortunate over the past six years to have had a front row seat to seeing how social media can truly change the world um, through the events in Haiti, in Japan, uh, the Arab Spring. It's really amazing to see how when people mobilize together what we can do. Um, I've been thinking for a long time about how people in this day and age, individuals are media companies in their own right, how people are very influential and have their own broadcast network, and what can be done if you actually take a lot of these influential voices and coordinate them towards one good cause. I think we need look no further than last week's events in the United States around SOPA to see that people coming together around one unified broadcast can actually play a very meaningful role um, in terms of putting social pressure around an issue. After leaving Facebook, I uh, was thinking about how to apply this in the real world, and uh, the Millennium Development Goals seemed like an amazing place to start. Um, personally, this issue affects me very deeply. My husband is from South Africa, and I'm a new mother, and uh, this had a lot of personal resonance for me. So I'm very excited to that we're embarking on this experiment to take a thousand of the most influential voices across Twitter and Facebook and over the next 48 months work with these people and their broadcast, their personal broadcast platforms in order to raise awareness and measurable results around mother to child transmission of HIV. Great, Eric. Thank you. Well, it's a real honor to uh, convene with this group. Uh, the United States government is really proud to be able to uh, partner uh, with private sector leaders to focus on this issue that is uh, so achievable. I think the Secretary of State, Secretary Clinton, 
and President Obama have really identified PMTCT, the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, as a high priority. As John says, the science is clear. Uh, we have the tools and have had the tools for many years to eliminate transmission uh, of HIV to children. The 390,000 children born each year is a number that we can absolutely uh, get down uh, to close to zero, just like in the developed world. Nearly every minute a child is born with HIV, and this demands a sense of urgency, as we've heard. And I think John has rightly said that the elimination is not only a goal, but as he has put it many times with me, a deadline. Preventing new infections among children across the globe is a smart investment. Dividends keep generating, money keeps being saved, uh, lives keep being restored, uh, and um, it allows for all of those uh, potentials to be realized. By saving mothers, we are protecting babies from being orphaned and, uh, again, add to the uh, negative impact uh, that uh, HIV can bring. We diminish that considerably. But no one has been able to do this alone. Uh, we first realized that antiretrovirals really diminished the transmission in 1992. That was when the AIDS Clinical Trials Group uh, 076 really was completed. It's a long time ago. And it's taken all these years to get it to the point where even in resource poor settings we can deliver this life-saving intervention. The President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief has prioritized this uh, since its inception in 2004. In 2009, uh, we turned the volume up in 14 countries, uh, developed uh, very explicit plans to eliminate transmission, uh, moved out of urban settings into rural settings aggressively. Uh, and did uh, really thorough mapping in 22 different countries to really understand uh, where uh, we were uh, interfaced and where we were not interfaced. It was launched uh, last June as the Global Plan's central goal to reduce the number of new pediatric, pediatric infections by 2015 by 90 percent. To get there, we really feel that we uh, need to converge an extraordinary coalition of leaders to uh, get those numbers down. The Business uh, Leadership Coalition, or Council, is an uh, extraordinary attempt to uh, converge, corral uh, this leadership uh, to help us bring new tools and a freshness in approach, uh, a rigor in follow-through, and a ability to partner with both national governments, provincial, and district governments to help uh, increase their ability to identify, enter, and retain HIV-positive women in continuums of services that allow for the antiretroviral drugs to be delivered. PEPFAR in the past year uh, tested 40 million people to find 660,000 HIV-positive pregnant women to prevent 202,000 pediatric transmissions. Just that effort alone, just to give you the sense of scale that this requires. It's an extraordinary deployment of resources, of individuals that needs to be present on day one, but to continue their ability to identify, enter, and retain uh, for uh, the duration. And that's been, that ability to sustain has been the most difficult piece. I think the social networking tool is going to help us kind of get that last couple of miles to the village. Uh, individuals who do have cell phones and uh, constantly are looking at them and checking them, even in the re most remote areas in which we work, and gives us an opportunity to really try to use this new technology uh, to uh, bring people into care, uh, keep them there, keep them on their medications in the appropriate way, and um, I hope uh, show us that uh, once again the application of this new technology uh, can improve the lives of, of people. We're excited about uh, this partnership with Randy and the social media syndicate. It's new for me uh, in terms of thinking of it this way, and I'm excited about trying something that uh, really is innovative but also has every reason for us to think it will be impactful. So I want to thank the group for convening, and I want to thank John for his leadership in this. He's been extraordinary, and it's a real pleasure to partner. Thank you. Great. And Dominic, just before we turn it over to you, we're um, blessed to have Cynthia Carroll join us. Cynthia is, Cynthia is the CEO of Anglo American, one of the uh, largest companies in the world and certainly the largest in Africa. And they've
been focused on this, among other uh, social issues, this uh, on mother-to-child transmission for many years. So it's thank you, Cynthia. Thank Dominic, you. you want to go ahead? Sure. Thank you, John. I just want to say a few things. First is that we're very excited uh, to be involved in this initiative. As John mentioned, I, we, we love the idea of very clear goals, 48 months uh, to try and get this to, to get this to get this to zero. Um, and this is a very important issue, as others have talked, so we're excited about that. I would say that we come at, come at it very much from the vantage point, if I could call it, of plumbers, which may seem like a strange thing to say, but a lot of the issues we think is around distribution and supply chain. It's execution, that, because as people have said before, we have the technology, we're just not getting the execution and the distribution. And this is something that we very much enjoy doing with a lot of consumer product companies and so forth around the world. Uh, resource companies, and we're very keen to apply that here to get into the nitty-gritty of the plumbing of making sure that this happens at, at the country level, but then we get down to the very specific uh, uh, regional and district levels. So again, we're excited to be involved, and I also want to thank John for convening such a, a great group. Great. Cynthia. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's great to be here and joining such a, such a panel. Uh, I'm told that there are 390,000 children uh, with new, uh, new child infections with HIV uh, in 2010. Uh, most of these children were born amongst uh, the roughly 1.4 million pregnant women in the world who are living uh, with HIV, and that means that 28 percent of children born from HIV-positive mothers in 2010 became infected with HIV. Uh, that's, a, that's a stunningly poor performance, to say the least, and I think we all would agree f uh, we would not tolerate such performance uh, in business, and there's no earthly reason why mothers should tolerate such a burden of the disease in their newborn uh, babies. Uh, it is possible to stop uh, new HIV uh, infections among children and to keep their mothers alive, and we believe that AIDS should not be a disease of children. Um, I'm excited about uh, joining this group, uh, determined to achieve the goal of an HIV-free uh, generation, and we're uh, equally determined to uh, be sure that the, the HIV-positive mothers of these children uh, are kept alive as well. And it is achievable by uh, 2015. Um, in, from my perspective, an Anglo-American, uh, it makes um, unmistakable uh, business sense uh, to pursue these goals. And I've seen the uh, burden of disease in developing countries. About 95 percent of our operations are in developing countries spread between Africa and South America. And we know, that, know the anguish it causes for millions of underprivileged uh, people. Uh, I also know that the disease is a monstrous impediment to human development and economic growth. And a simple investment in preventing the transmission of HIV infection from mothers to children and keeping the mothers alive will have a massive return in both human and economic uh, terms. Uh, it's long overdue uh, investment in women's health, and this makes uh, unmistakable, as I said, business sense. So it's time to get on with the job at hand and achieve our target by two 2015. And that's why I've offered to become a member of the Business Leadership Council for a generation born HIV free. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think in closing and before we turn it over, maybe if there's any questions, it's easy to, in a situation like this, talk about numbers. 390,000, you've heard that number many times now. Um, but for those of you who have had a chance to go to Africa and visit clinics and, and hold a baby, and look at that child and think about, you know, it's really just a lottery, a genetic lottery of where you were born. And if you were born in a village in Africa without the kind of health care uh, that is provided in the wealthy part of the world, um, that may be your lot in life. And since it is something that can be solved, and if when you hold that child you think about it, because we all have either children or nieces or nephews, and you think about what if this was one of mine? some part of my family, 
the emotion of really having the opportunity to eliminate this uh, and uh, do it in a fairly rapid manner is tremendous. And it's the kind of thing that gets people like ourselves and others very passionate about this. So thank you for being here. Do we have any questions? We have some mic coming. And please state your name and uh, affiliation, please. Um, not, not to bring you down from the passion, but could, could you walk us through a little bit what the, uh, someone could walk us through a little bit of the mechanics, how this is going to work, how you specifically are going to harness it <coughs> to get this done? Certainly, maybe, Eric, you and I can talk about that mm -hmm. together. There is already very significant country funding going into this issue led by PEPFAR uh, as number one, but the Global Fund, many wealthy countries are uh, providing capital to address this issue, both on a multilateral basis and on a bilateral basis. Um, the private sector has not played uh, enough of a role. Part of that is capital, but a lot of that, what Eric and Michelle Sidibe, who runs UNAIDS and others, have asked for is the human capital, the expertise. And so it's whether it's on logistics, delivery, information technology, training and awareness on the ground in Africa. There's a whole series of things that uh, business can and will bring to this topic to help accelerate um, what is already something that is moving in the right direction but needs to be driven to this deadline. I mean, Eric, you may have a... Sure, I'll just um, add that uh, the ability to um, deliver drugs that are effective that prevent transmission uh, to the baby uh, are well understood, how to deliver them, how to monitor them. Uh, who should get them, what we should look out for and be concerned about in delivering them. Uh, identifying the HIV positive woman has been a challenge uh, to uh, get her tested, once tested, to stage her, to figure out if she has other opportunistic infections, where she is in the progression of her infection herself, to deal with that, mm -hmm. and then turn to initiating antiretroviral drugs uh, to prevent the transmission, but continue to follow her over time, uh, keeping her in care to monitor her for uh, ill effects from the antiretroviral medications, which are now very rare. Once engaged in that uh, and following her over the nine-month gestation through the delivery process, and then once delivered to continue the antiretroviral drugs in her, in most instances, that's the best regimen, uh, through the breastfeeding period, and really for PEPFAR to continue her on antiretroviral drugs for the rest of her life. That's really our, uh, our, uh, uh, the regimen that we uh, prefer. We work in countries that have different um, standards and we have to be sensitive and open to that. We get in a scientific dialogue with them around uh, what improves the best chances of, la of preventing transmission. Three drugs takes it down to less than 2%. One drug takes it down to about 15%. Uh, s uh, transmission. So we uh, prefer the three drug regimens and getting those drugs on board for that through gestation, through delivery, through the period of breastfeeding uh, is, is a logistical uh, challenge. Um, once uh, you look at who in the medical delivery system uh, sees the pregnant woman and who initiates antiretroviral therapy, they're not the same physicians, nurses, and healthcare workers. Uh, we have harmonized that system so it's seamless now in the best systems that are out there, but that's the challenge. The, the last challenge is really getting uh, the woman who is in a rural setting and not in an urban setting where the services are not as readily available and distances are barriers to access uh, becomes the real challenge. Finally, uh, the logistical issues to support all of that, from delivery of drugs to uh, lab reagents to monitor uh, the person on the antiretroviral therapy, uh, to get the mother in care uh, post-delivery, uh, to continue the antiretroviral drugs, and if the baby is indeed positive, which isn't the uh, goal, but if the baby's positive, to get that child mm -hmm. in uh, regular medical care. So it's a continuum of care and services that takes all of our skills, all of our resources. The uh, kind of added brain trust that's coming in with the um, kind of private sector skill set, uh, we are very uh, optimistic, uh, will help us support our colleagues at the provincial and district levels in ministries of health and NGOs uh, that are not perhaps as sophisticated 
uh, in maintaining and enhancing those systems that support our ability to deliver this, uh, to, to deliver this service. So it's quite an orchestration. the private sector to raise funds for this act. Mm -hmm. Do you have any estimate about how much you needed from the private sector? Uh, we don't have a target mm -hmm. yet. We do have some very notable lead leaders on this who are already providing tremendous uh, funding, including Anglo-American, Chevron, J&J, &J, Merck, and quite a few other companies. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something we can do better on. And so as we are pulling uh, this business leadership board together, that's one of the things we'll be doing is setting a target for how much capital uh, can be raised. I should have Randy talk a little bit because having the population, you know, the general population involved and this generation that's so active in and around social media, um, we're seeing, um, you know, contribute, very significant contributions. So you might just talk about this. Sure, and we actually did a, an interesting experiment last year where we coordinated 50 of the most influential Twitter users in the United States around malaria. Um, we had them each, uh, every month, put out a, a proactive tweet, so proactively thanking the government for um, increased malaria funding or um, actually raising private donations by a $10 bed net. Um, and we believe that from those 50 people and their amplification network, we were able to generate 200 million impressions around malaria. So um, I, again, it's hard to quantify the exact reach on social media, but now that we're expanding the program to 1,000 people over 48 months and making this a global program, uh, we anticipate quite a, a large reach. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I may not have explained my earlier question well, but I think I was really going more to that. Is uh, how, uh, What is it that you hope to achieve through social media in this? Is it principally fundraising? Is it raising awareness? Is it, I mean, wh what is the role that social media will play in this effort? I think there's a few goals. I think uh, awareness to start, definitely. In fact, the first tweet and Facebook message that's going out this week across the syndicate is an awareness of uh, Generation HIV free. Um, but I think over the coming months, depending on uh, certain efforts of UNICEF, of other partner organizations, it might be fundraising, it might be awareness, it might be targeted messages at different governments, uh, government officials. So I think it depends on how things are progressing and where the kind of broadcast influence of the syndicate is needed. Um, but I truly believe that we could be onto something that could be in the future the um, crisis broadcast line of the United Nations. And uh, for me, this is an exciting issue to, to start this. All right. Any, well, any other questions? You know, John, if I could just add one thing to the social media, um, kind of our hopes. Uh, you know, one of the, um, I think, needs that we always find in working in um, the settings that we're in is that the ability to maintain the services after the donor community comes in, partners with partner governments to set up a medical delivery system for HIV services, is uh, our desire to make sure that those services continue even when donor dollars uh, recede or move on to other things. Uh, PEPFAR, the United States' uh, whole approach to uh, development work is to uh, address and understand the capacity expansion needs of the partner country that we're working in on day one. The social media tool, we hope, will serve to inform those who are using the services and those who care about those using the services to become a voice that speaks to government about the need to sustain and continue these services. Uh, that role of community is something that we have seen play out in the developed world as the central ingredient to sustaining and improving the services over time. HIV AIDS is a chronic progressive disease that's lifetime. Uh, it needs that kind of advocacy. So we're really optimistic that they're going to generate that for us. So. Yeah. Good. Great. Great. Thank you very much for uh, coming. Thank you, Kai, and uh, personally, and to WEF. Thank you very much for uh, coming today.